Hello, welcome. My name is Pastor Brian Madden and we're delighted you could join with us uh, over the, this series of programmes uh, with Creation Worldview Ministries. I'm absolutely delighted to have with me today here uh, in Northern Ireland, doing his Northern Ireland tour, uh, missionary Dr. Grady S. McMurdry. Uh, Dr. McMurdry is a full-time international creation missionary and a biblical scientific creationist. Uh, Dr. McMurdry, you're very welcome to Northern Ireland and we hope you're enjoying your tour. Well, I'm happy to be here and uh, getting a little bit of my heritage as well. <laughs> Excellent, indeed. Uh, Dr. McMurdry, uh, there are a few questions I'd just like to put uh, to you, but first of all, I think maybe uh, one of the, the best places to start is uh, for you to tell us something about your background, because I'm very aware that you were not always a creationist. So maybe you could tell us a bit about your background and how you actually became a creationist. Well, I was not raised as a Christian, not in a Christian home. Uh, I was born in San Francisco, California, uh, and my father was in the army but also a student at the University of California, Berkeley. And so uh, we moved over to Berkeley. He earned his degrees at Berkeley, became a teaching professor there, and at one time a secretary to the president. And so I grew up on the campus of the University of California, Berkeley, in a very literal way. Now, if you know anything about the University of California, Berkeley, mm -hmm. or Berkeley area, you know that you can't even uh, drive across the uh, city border without being an evolutionist. Yeah. You know? uh, Berkeley is really the capital of evolution. It's sort of the Athens of the modern mm -hmm. world. And so I grew up as an evolutionist, and I believed evolution. I taught evolution. I earned my science degrees as an evolutionist. Mm -hmm. And I taught evolution from the seventh grade to the university level. And so, yes, I was raised as an evolutionist. Uh, later at the age of 27, I would become a Christian. I became a Christian in a search for truth. Uh, I, would, I would say this, and it's a rather bold statement, that I actually have always been a seeker of truth. Right. Even when I was an evolutionist, I thought I had found truth in evolution. And of course, later I came to realize that I had not, but initially <laughs> I thought I had found truth in evolution. And of course, the problem with the education systems in countries around the world uh, is simply that instead of teaching critical thinking, instead of teaching mm -hmm. both sides of an issue and allowing a student to decide for themselves what they will believe, especially when it comes to a faith position such as creation or evolution, yeah. um, Today, instead, we're teaching by memorization. Mm. Now, when you teach by memorization, that is not education. That is indoctrination. And so I was a highly indoctrinated student. But at 27, in a search for truth, uh, and I had had Christians around me my whole life, obviously. Uh, I grew up with a somewhat Judeo-Christian ethic in the mm -hmm. United States. And simply at the age of 27, I said, enough's enough. You know. Either Christ is telling the truth, he's the son of God, he is God, etc., or he's lying. Yes, now, this is an ancient argument. I, I, you know, I didn't originate it. Yes. But it's an ancient argument that's been going around for 2,000 years. But I, it's a simple argument. And I, I said, <laughs> you know, with my academic, my scholastic skills, just study that question. Is Jesus telling the truth or not? Mm -hmm. And so for six months, entirely in a self-directed study, Though, of course, I look back and realize the Holy Spirit was involved. But there yeah. was no human guiding me, saying, no, you ought to read this, you ought to do that, and so forth. Uh, but just in a six-month self-directed study, I came to the conclusion after six months that Jesus was telling the truth. Amen. Now, of course, what I did was I read the Bible for the first time. I realized that the four Gospels are legal depositions. You could establish the existence of the man, Jesus Christ, yeah. in a legal court through these four depositions. And no historian today of any, any value whatsoever would suggest that a man, Jesus Christ, did not live. I mean, you know, we know he's as well-established as Leonardo da Vinci, basically. Yeah, of course. Uh, but the question is, who is he? And so I came to the conclusion after six months of diligent study that Jesus Christ was telling the truth. And the last thing that um, I really looked at that convinced me once and for all was when I looked at the histories, you know, we do have outside histories other than the Bible, Flavius Josephus, others. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that 500 people were willing to die without recanting that they had yeah. seen him after the resurrection, that was probably the final nail for me. Amen. Because no, no human being will voluntarily die to support a lie. Oh. Now, there are many people who have died supporting mm -hmm. a lie. Um, and it may be an unfortunate illustration, but I would simply say there were many good German soldiers who, who knew what they were fighting for was a lie. Yeah. But because they were coerced 
into it still fought, you know, to protect their families and so forth. And so people will not voluntarily die to support a lie, though many have. And so to think that 500 would not recant and would Amen. voluntarily die to support the point that they had seen Christ after the resurrection, that was really the final nail for me. Amen. And so I accepted that Jesus Christ not only lived, died, but was resurrected, that he was the Son of God, exactly who he said he was. And I did that in a room all by myself. Again, the Holy Spirit was there, but I just wasn't cognizant of that, so to speak. Um, and so I made my own decision that I would become a Christian. And I did that in a very intellectual way. You know, er everybody yes, comes yes. to Christ in a spectrum. Yeah, of course. Um, the intellect and the emotion are always involved. The question is what percentage. And so some people will come to Christ in a very emotional way, but there's a decision that they make, so there is an intellectual component. Mm -hmm. In my case, I came what I described 98% intellectually <laughs> and 2% emotionally. Of course, I got a lot more emotional about it after that. But nonetheless, <laughs> initially, that was what happened. And I know so little about Christianity. You know, being a scientist, uh, there's no checklist at the back yes. of the book. You know, you don't open it up and go, oh, well, now you do this, this, and this. And so I made an appointment with an associate pastor of a reasonably large church in our area. Uh, went in, explained what had happened uh, in no longer detail. Uh, he looked at me and said, is your decision firm? And I said to him, if you knew me, you wouldn't ask the question. Yeah. You see, when you find truth, you must accept it whether you like it or not. Yes. So being a, a truth seeker and to maintain intellectual honesty, when you find truth, you have to accept it. And so when I came to the realization Jesus was the truth, then I had to accept that. And yeah. then he was telling the truth. I had to accept that. But I went to him, and, and he asked me that question, and I gave him my answer. And, and he sort of took back a little bit. <laughs> uh, and then, then he said, okay. And he simply opened the Bible, showed me where I should make it public, showed me where I should be baptized in water. And I said, fair enough, it's there. And so uh, the next week I walked an aisle and made it public. And a couple of weeks later was baptized in water Amen. and started my Christian walk. But of course, I had a problem. <laughs> I had a major problem. Because when I accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, that just made me a saved evolutionist. Yeah. yeah. You know? And so I had a problem. How, you know, how do you have a, a personal relationship with the creator of the universe and teach evolution? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? of course, yes. And so I spent another 16 months. I, I took a blank piece of paper, in essence. And for 16 months after that, I asked myself the question, did God use evolution to create, in essence, mm -hmm. what we see around us today, bring it into existence? Um, and what I had learned and taught others was acceptable. Or was it wrong? That you could really trust the Bible about the earth and the universe being 6,000 years old, that, that God created it all in six literal 24-hour days, and was that science? Yeah. You know? Uh, and at the end of that 16 months, and so this is a process, okay. I came to the conclusion that not only was Jesus telling the truth, but the Bible was absolutely inerrant, Amen. that there was no science to support evolution. E evolution is not supported scientifically. Evolution is believed in religiously, theologically, yeah. philosophically. Yeah. So it's accepted philosophically. But it's not science. And so, uh, after that 16-month period, one night, at the end of it, I asked myself one question. Mm -hmm. Could the law of gravity ever evolve? <laughs> now, I, I would like everybody to seriously think about that for a second. Yeah. Could gravity have ever been anything less than it is? Now, it, gravity is the a universal force throughout the entire universe. Mm -hmm. It exists everywhere in the universe. Uh, it is the, the natural, physical basis upon which we can understand how God, the Holy Spirit, can be omnipresent. Yeah, yeah. If you think about it. Yeah. And so, could it have ever been anything less? Could it have come into existence from something else, etc.? And frankly, I could think of no way that gravity could ever be anything less than it is. And therefore, it had to come into existence whole and complete. If it came into existence whole and complete, it had to be created. Yeah. And you've seen those commercials, those advertisements where people stack a million dominoes up and then somebody just takes, ticks the first one, right? And suddenly a million go in different directions. It's a fabulous thing to see, right? But the same thing happened for me because I came to realize every law of science 
had to be created. Laws of genetics, laws of motion, laws mm -hmm. of thermodynamics. In order to have law, you have to have a lawgiver. Oh, yes. And then, of course, I took a look at natural process. And again, this is all part of my, my 16 months. Mm -hmm. But no process has any value unless it's whole and complete. I mean, think about it. Each and every human being, for instance, learns in a way that they have determined is best for them. You know, if you're going to get the best marks in school, then you find out what's best for you as to how you to study and mm -hmm. learn. So, for instance, I might read something one time and I have it, you might read it three times and then you have it, or you may have to read it out loud, or maybe you need to see it visually in picture yes. forms. But everybody learns best in a certain process. And it's not the same for all of us. And so, think about the uh, idea of not studying that way. Well, if you don't study that way, then you're not going to learn as well. Or in nature, the photosynthesis. I mean, we all know about photosynthesis from school. And today we have very cleverly figured out the, the process by which chemically light energy is turned into food. Mm -hmm. It's responsible for approximately 98, 99% of all life on Earth existing. Um, but if you remove one step in that photosynthetic process, the entire thing doesn't work. Incredible. And so photosynthesis had to come into existence whole and complete. It could never have been anything less. It could not have evolved from something less. Yeah. And of course, having been uh, both biological, physical, and natural scientist in my background, and knowing much about the sedimentary rock layers and fossils in the ground and so forth, I came to the realization that while in the textbooks they show you this nice, neat, clean order of layers and a progression of fossils and so forth, it doesn't exist in the ground. Now, the layers exist. The fossils exist. Mm -hmm. But the order in which they show them in the textbook doesn't exist. <laughs> and so in reevaluating scientific law, reevaluating natural process, reevaluating physical evidence, I realized that the, the fossil record and sedimentary mm -hmm. rock layers we see around us are simply the result of a worldwide flood. Much better understood from a flood geology standpoint than an evolutionary yes. geology standpoint. And so I became a biblical scientific creationist. Now at that Amen. point, uh, not only was I a Christian, not only was I now a creationist, but I had <laughs> another problem. Because my problem now was, do I get mad or do I get even? <laughs> of course. And so I am not the kind of person to get mad. I have a very even temperament. So I decided to get even. Yes. And so for now, the last 39 years, I've been traveling the world as a teaching missionary teaching on creation versus evolution, both biblically and scientifically, mm -hmm. and showing that they are absolutely 100% compatible, that I can go from science to the Bible to science to the Bible in the same paragraph, back and forth, because they have the same author. It's really very simple. <laughs> and of course, today I teach a literal 24-hour, six-day creation approximately 6,000 years ago. Uh, we're not going <clears> to <throat> argue over five or ten years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that it's good Bible, and it's also good science. Amen. Well, we, we, are, we are delighted here in Northern Ireland. The only one of the churches that you made the decision to get even. Uh, <laughs> Thank that, you, sir. That, that's, that's most certainly true. I, I would imagine uh, being involved in that scientific background when you, I don't like to use the term came out, but when, when people became aware, oh, uh, uh, Dr. McMurtry is now a Christian who believes in a, a young earth and, and, and a literal 24-hour days, they, they must have been uh, ha angry as well as somewhat confused, and I'm sure in many ways did not, were, were not polite to you because of this huge turn. Would that be a fair assumption? I, I think you have put it more than politely. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but on, on one point that, that, that you said, uh, getting back to the uh, 6,000 years of the earth and the 24-hour the day, uh, it's, there's great debate even within Christendom, and there are many books out uh, uh, which state millions of years. No one really has a definite time period. And then, of course, there are, are people who, who believe in the literal 24-hour day and that the uh, Earth the universe is 6,000 years. Uh, could you explain, obviously that is your position, and for our viewers, how old is the Earth universe, uh, both biblically and scientifically. Could you do that for us? Sure. Um, obviously, if we take a look at this, there's, as you say, controversy amongst people. Uh, the 
two basic positions in terms of time are it is either very, very young, 6,000 years old, or billions. Yeah. There's really nobody in between, although there have been in the past, but really no, today nobody accepts, you know, like 100,000 or, mm -hmm. or, or that sort of thing. So you have either very young or very old. Yeah. Now, for the evolutionists, they require time. It's a tenet of their religion. Yeah. Without time, evolution simply didn't happen. And so I point out, again, that for the evolutionists, they must have millions and billions of years. It's a requirement. But they have absolutely not one single scientific proof wow. that it's old. Evolutionists use five major arguments, a few minor arguments, which are only arguments to suggest to people that it's old. They convince and they deceive people into believing it's old by these arguments, <clears throat> including one I love. Well, it just looks old, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and they will talk about starlight and time and so forth. Uh, but there are good scientific answers to know how you can, in fact, have 13.7 billion light years of distance and still only be 6,000 years old. I write about these, for instance, in my book. I show eight ways that you can do this scientifically. And, and, of course, we're discovering new things all the time. Uh, we might address those kind of things specifically later, but, but the creationist. Now, from a biblical standpoint, when we take a look at the genealogy, for instance, of Mary and Luke, it goes from Mary to her father, back to David, back to Adam, the son of God. Yeah. Clearly in the genealogy, now, of course, we have the genealogy in Matthew of Joseph yes, sure. from David down, and he is the adoptive father of Jesus. But the bloodline, which is in Luke, going from Mary back to Adam, is clearly basically a 6,000-year process. Yeah. So the Bible is very specific about this. And God is very specific that he created things in six little 24-hour days, not only in Genesis, but, but also established in Exodus and so on. But scientifically, and I, I think that this is where we really must address this for people because yep. they've been so indoctrinated in millions and billions of years in school, commercials, movies. Today we have what are called geochronometers. Now a geochronometer, we simply break the word down, geo like geology, geography, earth, matter, universe. Chronometer is a time clock, yep. a measurement of time. And so a geochronometer is simply an earth time clock or a universe time clock. And today we have over 270, and the number is actually approaching 300, scientific geochronometers to prove that the Earth, the solar system, the galaxy, the universe are young. Amazing. Now, some of them are technically agreed, but most of them are incredibly simple and can be taught to children. And so I can teach a child, I can teach an adult who does not know much about science, for instance, a dozen, two dozen in an hour or so, and uh, you can remember them fairly easily and so forth. And so uh, we really do have this evidence. Now, just to mention some, I mean, heat loss of the Earth, recession rate of the moon, heat loss of the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, radioactive materials found on the moon that couldn't be there if it was old. We have rotation rate of the sun. We have too much dust in the solar system for it to be old because that dust should have been sucked up by the gravity of the sun and planets. Yeah. Short period comets. The rings around our planets, and we do have rings around more than one planet, are decaying incredibly quickly. Some of the rings that we found from uh, satellites that were sent out in the 70s will be gone in another 100 years. They're decaying wow. so quickly. We have barred spiral galaxies throughout the universe at every distance that we can look in every direction. Uh, we have a total, uh, not a lack of, but a very small number of supernovas, what are called S N-1A supernovas. Mm -hmm. This proves, believe it or not, that our Milky Way galaxy, that's the galaxy that we live in, is less than 7,000 years old. Wow. And so it doesn't matter where we look, in the Earth, on the Earth, near the Earth. Um, one of the things I love to point out is that, of course, uh, being in the UK, you know, the, the moon is a predominant factor in tides. Yes. Now, we know, for instance, that uh, if you were to bring the moon back towards the Earth, it's moving away now, but if you bring it back towards the Earth, tides would get higher and higher. Now, that would have a dramatic impact on a variety of things. And uh, for those that uh, do believe in the Bible that are listening, mm -hmm. um, you remember the census that was taken by Caesar Octavius Augustus? Yes. That the world should be taxed. 
And this caused Mary and Joseph to have to leave Nazareth and go to Bethlehem, the city of David, because they are both of the line of David, and be taxed. And this caused Mary to give birth to Jesus in Bethlehem, as was prophesied, a Nazarene born in Bethlehem. We have that census, and it was taken in Britain at the same time. Mm -hmm. We know of 35 villages on the northeast coast of England that don't exist there anymore because they have eroded into the North Sea. Wow. And if we take a look at this data, England along that northeast coast has eroded two miles westward in 2,000 years. Now, that's a pretty good window. You know, 2,000 <laughs> years is a pretty good window. Of course, yes. And that tells us that England has been eroding away at five foot three inches per year for 2,000 years on that coast. And the same yeah. thing is true of, for instance, Dover, Kent area, and so forth. Um, and of course, in some places, the cliffs have been protected, and others, they're not. But again, if we were to just do the math, or, or I love the way you all say this, let's do the maths. Do the maths. I, I yes. love that, the maths. <laughs> If you take a look at the erosion rate, say, along the White Cliffs of Dover, uh, what if, what if they yeah. were eroding at only six inches per year, which is a <laughs> fairly small amount. Yes, yes. But evolutionists, the, those are chalk deposits. They're crawl Cretaceous. The very name actually comes from the White Cliffs of Dover, chalk de ch deposit, chalk okay. age. Um, and evolutionists would say this is approximately 65 to 145 million years old. So if the minimum age is 65 million, but they've been eroding it six inches a year for 65 million years, yeah. then uh, England yeah. would have eroded 6,200 miles westward, and I think that's a problem. A big problem indeed. Uh, one of the simplest ones that I love, and I love to teach this to children and others, that, that there's only approximately 4,500 years worth of mud at the mouth of all the rivers of the world. The Mississippi. Yeah. which drains roughly two-thirds of, of our country and so forth in parts of Canada, uh, only has 4,500 years worth of mud. The Amazon only has 4,500 years worth of mud. Amazon, Indus, Ganges, and so forth, uh, only has that much mud. Now, if the Mississippi were millions of years old, as evolutionists claim, the entire Gulf of Mexico would be filled in by now. <laughs> and, and so these are really simple. Wow. You know, and, wow. and so anybody can learn them, anybody can know them, but these are arguments that it's all young. And, and again, I could mention many more. Absolutely. I, and, and I would say this too, in reading the scientific literature, which I do constantly, um, I would say that we are actually <laughs> discovering approximately one new argument for a young Earth, young universe per month yeah. today. Wow. Volcanic activity on moons around pl other planets, <clears throat> like Io, <clears throat> for instance. Uh, we have at least two moons in, around other planets with volcanic activity, but they should be stone cold if they're as old as evolution <laughs> say. And you couldn't have this volcanic activity. And, and the, the list just goes on. Wow. The, the, I'm right in saying that the, the, the core of the Earth is cooling also? That, that's what I said, the heat loss of the Earth, and what I mentioned earlier. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Lord Kelvin back in the 1800s refuted Darwin on that very argument. Yeah, yeah. Now his numbers were not as accurate as ours are today. <clears throat> But the earth is a big, hot rock. And, and think about it, if you took a coal out, out of a barbecue pit yep. and set it over by itself, it's red hot. Yes. But if you put it over by itself, mm. it cools down. It to cool. And the earth is the same way. You are not alive today because of the heat which comes in from the sun every day. Mm -hmm. You are alive today because of the heat which comes in from the sun every day and the heat going past you on the way out every day. If you t took, um, I, I don't know the exact figures for a football field here, mm -hmm. but yeah. it, a football mm -hmm. field in the States is a bit smaller. Yeah. But if you took the heat loss of the earth uh, off of just one of our football fields, because I know that measurement, you could light four 100 watt light bulbs. Wow. And that's how much, that's how much <coughs> energy has been lost in just that amount per day. Wow. And so if you take that over the entire surface of the earth, and you get to realize we're radiating more heat every day than we get. God knew that that would be the case. So that's why he put so much heat in the side, mm -hmm. because the heat from the sun is not sufficient. So he, he gives us both to keep us alive. It's a, the Earth is such a specially designed satellite. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, and therefore, the cooling rate tells us the Earth is young, because if it were billions of years old, it would be completely stone cold to the center. <laughs> uh, and of course, I would just like to point out that the Earth really is, I mean, in our space program, you know, we put yeah. people on the moon, we put people <coughs> in outer space, and of course today there are astronauts from a variety of worlds, uh, countries are, that are now in space. 
but but think about it for a second. We think we're so proud. Mm. You know, we built the space shuttle. We put it up there, seven astronauts into space, and leave them up there for a couple of weeks and bring them back down. And boy, aren't we hot stuff! But think about this: God designed a satellite with seven billion people alive on Earth, uh, which is self-sustaining, and we think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, but the, the, in aspects of the Earth, in terms of the axis of, from the inclination from the sun and size of it, I mean, gravity being an issue, and and God had to create the moon. Yeah, you know, if you think it's a funny thing to say, God had to create the moon. Well, how can I say that? Yeah. Well, the fact of the matter is, this is the only planet with just one moon. We have planets with no moons, and we have planets with many moons. But this is the only planet that has one, and ours is ten times larger than any other. And he put it at a certain distance, and why? Well, first of all, to stir the oceans, because the oceans become stagnant yeah, if they aren't stirred stirred. by the tides. Yeah. Uh, secondly, to maintain uh, our rotation is stable, because without the moon, the Earth would not be stable. We would start to wobble. Uh, and it has to be where it is to maintain a 24-hour day, because if it was farther away, the day would slow down. And, and, and you just go on and on and on, and you realize how finely tuned. <clears throat> you know, people ask me, well, why is the universe as big as it is? Why did God make a hundred billion galaxies that we know of? And, mm. and there are three trillion stars just in our galaxy and so forth. And so, it's very simple. One, to prove how big God is. <laughs> because he says, if you, can, if you can number the stars, I'm not God. And so we've never well, found them all. Yes. Amen. But there's another reason, too, and I, I know it's hard to believe, but the universe has to be as big as it is in order for human life to exist on Earth. Because it has to do with certain constants like alpha and gravity and so forth. And without those things finely tuned like that, we couldn't exist. Wow, that is absolutely fantastic and fascinating. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. McMurtry. Uh, we, we will continue with uh, part two, so please join us, and uh, we will be asking Dr. McMurtry some uh, more questions. So, so please join us in part two.